I'm Realtor Deb Tomorrow, and this is At Home in Bloomington, brought to you by Karen Russell, Ruoff Home Mortgage. We profile the people, places, and resources that make Bloomington Bloomington and help you live your best life at home in Bloomington. Hello, and welcome to At Home in Bloomington. I'm Realtor Deb Tomorrow, your host. And I am joined, as always, by the lovely Miss Karen Rastel, best time lender in the state of Indiana. She's waving. Princess wife, hello. Hello, hello. So, um, if my voice sounds a little weak today, it's because it's May when we're recording this, and, I mean, who doesn't have allergies? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you sound okay. I'm getting there, but I'm still a little bit... You know that Friends episode where Phoebe... Do you remember? She, Phoebe <laughs> yes. got a cold. Yes. And then she's singing, smell like cat, no. Right. You know, I'm like that. I'm a little, I keep like running around going, I'm smelly cat, and people are like, that doesn't make sense. But I'm I like, get in it. my head, all the dots connect. But that may also be the you know Benadryl talking. So anyways, we have a nuts and bolts how-to show today that I'm kind of excited about. You mm-hmm. know, we do a lot about fun stuff to do um, in Bloomington or useful resources. This is fun. Our guest is fun. I was going to say, I think so, yes. But it's also um, just an important how-to show. So planning for the future, and actually I think the next show we're going to do sort of a similar topic too. I don't know. I'm on a practical kick, so bear with me, but this is important stuff. Whether it's 10 years or 50 years, planning ahead for the future is so important, and yet people don't do it unless they're your husband. (laughs) I would say that is it. That's probably an accurate statement, fair statement. He, like, took all the planning, like, vibes in the universe, and he, like, Mm -hmm. took them all. He may have. Because he, like... I don't want to say he overplans, but he plans everything. I mean, your future is solid. Yes. And I, I think he was always like that because yeah. I know that that's not, like, I could never do that myself. You didn't bring that to the no, table? I did not bring that to the table. I kind of relinquished that when I brought everything to the yeah. table. I'm like, you can have that piece. Right, right. But no, it is very important, and uh, he does take it to an nth degree, but definitely people need to have some type of plan in place. Yeah. Financial and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, yeah, I don't understand why people aren't willing to do it. And I think that part of the reason might be that it's daunting and you don't know where to start. That, and I also think too, it's probably, I don't know, it could be a little intimidating too, that you're at a certain age where it's like, oh, you know, is it too late to start? Right. You know, but anyways. Or is it too early to start? Like, why bother now? I don't have, you know, any money. I don't have any plans. I don't really know what I'm going to do. These are all questions we're going to answer on today's show. So I want to encourage everyone to listen, and hopefully we'll clear up some barriers today as we welcome our guest, Matt Doring, who is, what's your official title? Financial advisor, senior financial... Vice president of investments. There you go. With Thurston Springer, which is a relatively uh, new to Bloomington um, financial advising firm. Um, It's based up in Indianapolis, and they've had a big following, and you just opened a branch down here. Correct. Uh, And you are located at, I know this, 414 North Morton. Got a girl. Right across from the uh, farmer's market. Okay. Uh, So great location down there. Um, But I really, I've been working with Matt for a long time. I've known him for a very, very long time. And um, so I was really excited about getting him to come on the show and talk about some of these barriers. Um, what do you think? Is it the older people who haven't gotten started yet, or is it the younger people who need to get started? Who who do you think is in biggest need of listening to today's show? Every single person out there. Yeah. You're never too young. You're never yeah. too old. So when should someone start with a financial advisor? I think what we're going to talk about today, let me back up. Back up. Um, we're going to talk sort of in generalizations. Obviously, you have guidelines and rules that you can't say, you know, oh, you need to put $50,000 or you need to put $20 on whatever. The horse that won the Kentucky Derby and then didn't win the Kentucky Derby, but no, that's not what we're talking about today. Um, so we're talking more generalizations about who should be using a financial advisor and how do you find one and what questions should you ask um, and, um, you know, what should you be looking for? And, why, like and, and how to have that conversation with someone as to why they should be seeking out mm-hmm. an expert. Right. Yeah. Especially if you're part of a, a couple and maybe one person is on board and the other person isn't on board. True. That may be it. Well, that's a question for after the break. We'll give you the break to think about that one. All right. So back to my question. (laughs) When should someone start with a financial advisor? As early as possible. Um, Time is your greatest ally with investing. A lot of people have a a common misconception 
I'm trying not to be monotone. <laughs> Smile uh, when you talk. <laughs> a common misconception that it takes a great sum of money in order to invest. The truth is, is when I started investing, I think I started with a savings account of ten bucks. Mm-hmm. It became a hundred, five hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred grand. Time is an ally. So the earlier you start, the better off you're going to be in the long run. But if you're, you know, 18, can you, I mean, this seems like a silly question, but if you're 18, can you go meet with a financial advisor and start investing money? Absolutely. Highly encouraged. Okay. And I know that um, we did something for Eurus' son when he was like, I think he was still maybe 17 or something. And we sat him down with someone and was like, just talk to him just to kind of get the ball rolling and get him thinking. And, uh, um, you know, they do some math and they say, if you put, you know, 25 bucks away every month, 25 bucks, Mm -hmm. you know, by the time you're 65, here's how much it could grow into. And it was an astronomical number. I heard an example 25 years ago and it's always stuck with me. Somebody gets out of college, they're 22 years old. They say, I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to put two grand in my IRA. This is back when we could only put Mm -hmm. two grand in an IRA per year. And they got up to age 30 and they said, I'm done. I'm done. They've invested a total of 16 grand. Person B decided to get out of college at 22, party until they're 30. They wake up and they go, oh my gosh, it's getting late. I'm going to pump money in this thing till I'm 65. So they've been, they're doing it for 35 years, mm-hmm. a total of 70 grand. All things being equal, who has more money at retirement? That's a question. I mean, you would think the person who put 70 grand in would end up with more. The person that started earlier and only put in 16 grand wins. Wow. Pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, that is. So earlier the better, but then also we'll say if it's late, better late than never. Cue the, you got to start somewhere. I'm going right. to say cue the sound clip of like, show me the money. Right. Because I think when a young person can see, like get Deb's whiteboard out, but can mm-hmm. see that multiplying and how that can add up so quickly, yeah. it may it may just change their mind on, yeah, I think that I should start doing this now. Right, right. So how much money do you need? To be able to talk, not to be able to talk to a financial advisor, but I mean, to make it worth your while. I don't know how to phrase that question, but you know what I'm saying? To make it worth the financial advisor. Well, I mean, that too. We're going to talk about that later because I am curious about, you know, I think it's important to understand how a financial advisor gets compensated. But, um, you know, I mean, if you're making, if you're just like fresh out of college and you're making, you know, 40 grand a year, or if you're even just working a job in high school and making 10 bucks an hour, what? Everything starts with a plan. So when you sit down with a financial advisor, you articulate your goals. Here's where I want to be. This is what I'm planning for. I want to buy a house. I want to put my kids to college. I want to do this. I want to retire. And you craft a plan. And that plan eventually spits out off a computer and it tells you this is how much you need to set away. This Let's discuss your risk and find out if you can get to your desired retirement. And then you monitor and make adjustments along the way. Financial advisors all aren't created equal. Yeah. Um, Some financial advisors that are new to the business will accept a hundred dollar a month contribution and they will help you navigate your entire life. Other advisors who have a substantial tenure are looking for clients with a minimum amount of money, Mm -hmm. a million dollars or half a million bucks to get started. So it's important you choose the right advisor to help you get started. So is that a fair question to ask if you're starting to shop for financial advisors? I mean, just... This is how much I think I have to invest every month. Yeah. What are your account minimums? Yeah. You know, okay, where do I get started? Yeah. Okay. Account minimums. There you go. Buzzword. Got that, Rachel? Account minimums. Because I know that's a barrier for some people. And I know I've run into financial advisors who, you know, are more than happy to talk with anybody who's got, you know, 25 bucks to put away in the month because they know that, you know, in the long term, those people will become you know, long-term clients. Yeah. And I think for the, for the young person themselves, um, I know... Personally speaking, at that age, I would have thought, well, I'm not going to bother this professional's time because I'm just starting in my, you know, in my career and I need to figure out how I'm going to pay my rent and those type of things before thinking of saving for my, my retirement, which again, this is an episode where we're trying to debunk that, that everyone should start, start doing this sooner versus later. There's two types of young people. Option A is the person that believes we're paid on some type of salary and they're going to come in and utilize our time 
and leave and not make any contributions and go do their own thing. That's like a lot of people think that about a realtor too, <laughs> that, you know, we'll show them houses and somehow we're getting paid, but yeah. And whatever. then you have unless other people anything. that go, well, I'm not going to bother this person's time unless it's worth both of our while. Yeah. And so yeah. I've seen them both. Right. So that's a, a good question, I think, to ask. I want to go over some other questions that people should ask when they're, and I don't, we probably should have split this up into like, if you're a young person just starting out, what are questions that you should ask a financial advisor to see if it's someone, you know, that is a good fit for working with you? What are their qualifications? Um, there's a lot of licenses, a lot of certifications that we have to get throughout the years, um, and everybody has different licenses and every license allows you to sell a different product or a different type of product. So it's important to understand what they can sell. Mm -hmm. It's also important to understand, are they a proprietary firm that can only sell, for example, if they work at Chevy, can they only sell Chevy cars mm -hmm. or can they sell Chevy, Maserati, Ferrari, mm -hmm. you name it. Matt's a car guy. That's an aside. Cars. <laughs> so I want to stop and describe this room for a minute. I feel I've got a court stenographer that's over taking notes. Yeah, that's and Rachel. She takes notes so we can promote. Asking these questions. And you feel, and your head's all red because you're like, feel like you're on, on a, yeah, in court, right? You're under oath. I'm being taped. Exactly. You have to be careful what you say. So, okay, well, let's back up again. Say I'm just jumping all over the place because this is a confusing topic for me too. And um, I think I'm trying to remember how I kind of started working with a financial advisor. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like, Oh, this is something I need to do. I think it was, I was leaving a job and had some 401k money that I needed to, I wanted to put somewhere else. I didn't want to leave it with the company. And so it was like, I, and then I think I was dating a guy <laughs> this was a million years ago up in Indianapolis. He was a financial advisor. And I was like, okay, you can have my money. That probably wasn't the smartest decision in the world. <laughs> Um, yeah, cause then I had to move my money when I moved down here and he called and congratulated me on the baby. And I was like, there's no baby. It was, yeah, there's a story there. But anyways, <laughs> I digress. I thought okay. you dated him. I was going to yeah. say that's almost parallel to my story, except all the end of it, except, <laughs> <laughs> which is like, you have a job, you are leaving that employer and now you've got your 401k and you have to do something with it. And I was so naive. I thought, why do I have to do anything with it? Like, I didn't even realize that you needed to do something yeah. after that. You but. can leave it there, but then I have this, like, paranoia about, like, my money split up in all different locations, and I'm not going to, when I'm old and senile, I'm not going to remember where all my money is, <laughs> so I need to get it all in one location. But I know a lot of people, too, who leave their job, and then they just take their 401k, and what do they do with it? They're like, score. They cash it out, and they think, sweet, I got a little bonus. I I've seen that. Yeah, right? I had a friend who did that. He lived off it for a while, and I was like, what are you doing? And he said, I I'm taking my life back. And I'm like, no, you're, like, ruining you're your future. your future. <sighs> but anyways, wow. okay. um, so, I mean, that's kind of how I stumbled into it. Um, I don't know where I was going with that story. I think you were trying to figure out or ask Matt, you know, when is it? When is a good time for someone to start thinking? I know we, we keep talking about it sooner the better, but yeah. when is it? When should someone start reaching out to a financial advisor uh, is it fresh out of college? Is it that fresh out of high school at 18? Yeah. Um, is right. it when you leave your job? And The habits we start when we're young tend to continue when we get older. Mm -hmm. So if you start saving and you make it a, a, a normal practice, mm -hmm. you're going to find you continue to save. Yeah. And if you're working with a financial advisor, just think of all the things we go through in life. We graduate college. A lot of us have college debt. We've got to figure out how do we pay off college debt and still accumulate some wealth. Um, oh my gosh, we have to buy our first house. We're going to need a down payment. So I'm going to need some help navigating debt. Um, oh my gosh, we're going to have a baby. So we should probably think about what are we going to do for the child's education? Now we need a bigger house. Kind so we call Deb. Baby. We call Deb and we, we buy a house. Right. Um, and then we start to think about our retirement and a good financial advisor can help corral your mind and say, okay, let's, let's, kind of take this and break it into little pieces mm -hmm. and discuss how we get there. So this is a start thought. Do you remember that one time I went to band camp and uh, <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> the show's going off the rails because I've known Matt for so long. We're like, whatever. Um, I was at band camp and we would take notes and he would always say, start thought. And you'd like make a little star in your notebook because that was like a really important mm -hmm. point or whatever. Okay. So this is start thought is that um, I think there's a misconception that financial advisors are just for retirement and they're not. 
Um, they certainly want you to put things in your IRA that you can't touch for a long time, but there are lots of options and things you can do for short-term goals as well. well you know, what's, a, what's the shortest-term goal? I mean, if someone was like, you know, I want to buy a house in two or three years, it, is it worth talking to a financial advisor? Is there something you oh, can do? Yeah. Because we just don't have one goal. Right. I've got a client whose number one goal, she's about my age. Mm-hmm. I'm not Older than me. Discuss that. Um, <laughs> but one of her goals is she wants to take an exotic vacation once a year. So we make sure she has adequate savings, and uh, but at the same time she wants to retire. So you end up having to having multiple goals. Right. And fortunately, with the advent of wonderful computers, now we can keep track of all those goals. We don't have to write them on notepads right. like we used to. Right. So I think that's a really important point that I you know, and maybe that's just my misconception my little narrow mind that only goes towards retirement because when Matt always, he's been after me for years about like, what are your goals? What are your goals? And then finally one day I came to him and I said, I got, I got it. I got it. I got it. (laughs) And because I kept thinking retirement, I'm like, I don't really know what I want that to look like. But then I was like, Oh, I need to be able to afford Meadowood. That was my goal. And he said, I'd be okay. So, okay. And I've stopped there, but you know, certainly I think there are some shorter term goals that, you know, we should, does your husband work off short term goals as well as longer term goals? Yes. And I think a lot of that changed with, um, I, there was a life event, you know, his father passed away. And so his dad and his mom didn't get a chance to do a lot of things because they were waiting until Mm. they were both retired, Mm -hmm. things like that. So he had a shift in how he was going to make things happen sooner for us. You know, you know, we're, we are getting up there in age and it's harder to be as active as we'd like to. And so he did shift that, that thought and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. But yeah, we had to scale back on a lot of things. Some more trips to Vegas now while you can still (laughs) walk the miles. There you go. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Life is like taking a trip. And if you think about taking a trip, we book our hotels we make sure the car's full of gas, we pack our bags, we hit the road, and we start traveling. But we encounter things upon the way. We're driving too fast, we get a speeding ticket. And part of your plan has to allow for those. And when you have a written financial plan, you're prepared for all those mm-hmm. little obstacles. And you've got something you can follow and know you're going to be okay. I always wonder if one of the reasons people don't want to plan is because they don't want to be tied down to that one direction. And I always say it's just a roadmap and you have to have a destination so you know you're headed in the right direction, but that doesn't mean you can't detour. It doesn't mean you can't be like, I don't want to go to Toledo. Let's go to Cleveland instead that, you know, you can Mm -hmm. do that too and and adjust and make changes. But, um, but I think some people are just kind of like, hi, I just want to you know roll with the punches. And I think you can do both, even if you have a plan, oh, except absolutely. your husband, he can't really, he's, he's, pretty, he's, no, he's, he's getting really, he's getting good at, really? yeah, at proud of relaxing time. and having a good time. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right. We're going to take a break and we come back and want to talk a little bit more about what exactly a financial advisor does. Like what are the services you provide? Um, how you get paid? Because, I have uh, someone in my family um, who always says of her financial advisor who is not here um, in Bloomington at all, um, I think he's just trying to make more money off me. And, yeah, and so she doesn't have a trust factor with him, and that kind of bothers me. So, you know, some some ways that we can understand that a little bit better so that we can have a trust factor um, and maybe some misconceptions about financial advisors, too. So we are talking with Matt Doring, who is the um, – oh, tell me your title again. It's so impressive. And to me, you're just Matt. Branch manager, vice president of investments. Vice know, president of investments with Thurston Springer, uh, 414 North Morton. And we'll give you some more contact information after the break. We'll be right back here at home in Bloomington. Hi, this is Karen Rastel with Ruoff Home Mortgage. Did you know that you can often save money by purchasing your own house instead of paying rent? There are a lot of perks in owning a home of your own. So contact me today at 812-606-7653 so I can help you invest your hard-earned money for yourself instead of your landlord. Ruoff Home Mortgage is an Indiana corporation licensed by the Indiana Department of Financial Institutions. This is not an offer for extension of credit or a commitment to lend. All loans must satisfy company underwriting guidelines, equal housing lender, NML Number 141868. This is your Real Estate Real List. Real advice on buying and selling real estate based on my experience closing over 800 home sales. 
For most of us, credit scores are a necessary evil if we want to own a home. Understanding how credit scores are calculated can go a long way to empowering you to improve your score. The better your score, the more and better financing options you have. Here are five factors that go into calculating your score. Number one, your payment history makes up about 35% of your overall credit score. This means late payments. Number two, 30% of your credit score is your utilization rate. It's how much credit you have available compared to how much you are using. Number three, 15% of your score is based on the length of your credit history. Number four, 10% of your score comes from your mix of types of credit you have successfully managed. And number five, new credit accounts and inquiries are responsible for another 10% of your credit score. If your credit score needs help, the most important thing to know is that time can heal and every day matters. Paying your bills on time, not maxing out all your credit cards, and not getting new credit cards just to get that 10% discount at Kohl's are all actions that will help improve your credit score and financing options. For more information on credit scores, listen to my Real Real Estate Today podcast, episodes 34, 35, and 36 for anything you ever wanted to know about credit from what's a FICO to the legitimate resources available to improve your credit situation. You can find the podcast on my website, YouTube channel, and iTunes. My name is Joe Reinhardt, and Deb Tomorrow is my realtor. Deb helped us to sell a property that we had previously listed for which we were unable to even generate an offer. Deb's Responsiveness, professionalism, and her aggressive marketing strategy led to multiple full-price offers for our listing. And that's why I think Deb should be your realtor, too. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to At Home in Bloomington. I'm your host, Deb Tamara. Before we get back to our guests, I want to do our Facebook follow segment, which is Class 101, which is a dedicated group of professionals helping make college affordable through coaching and helping you be organized. And I really want people to um, follow them on Facebook and also listen to our show. I can't remember what episode it was. It's probably in the 20s somewhere. Um, because these are really good ethical people. Um, the you know, We're recording this in uh, May of 2019, and some of these college prep things have been in the news. Well, one in particular has been in the news. Oh, Aunt Becky. But anyways... Uh, you know, these people are legit, they're honest, they're ethical, Mm -hmm. they're helping your child be strategic um, and make good decisions. And they're also really good financial aid detectives. Um, So they've got their stuff, good stuff going on over there. And I love this time of year too, because they're posting all the kids that they work with and what schools they've decided to go to. And so that's really exciting too. So follow them on Facebook and you'll see that. But We're talking today with Matt Doring of Thurston Springer Financial Advisors, and I thought this was kind of a good segue because saving for college is a big goal for a lot of people. There's so many ways to do it. Yeah. It all depends on how restrictive you want it to be, uh, whether you need tax credits, um, who gains control of the money when they're 18. Um, So there's a lot of variables to consider when planning for college, but a thousand different ways to get there. And so that's... uh, I guess one of the great reasons to go talk to a financial advisor so that you can understand all your different options, because I think, you know, we see the 529 plan, you know, that's one that I, you hear about and you see about and you just think, okay, easy enough, I'll just do that. But that may not be, you know, there's drawbacks to that too, right? So you don't have to go to all the details. Yeah. And so I think that's, um, you know, a good financial advisor is going to go over those pros and cons and, uh, and help you decide what's the best solution for you. So let's ask the question. Let's just throw it out there on the table because we all want to know this, right? I, I mentioned how I know someone who always thinks that her financial advisor is making decisions based on his interests and what's going to make him more money. So how do financial advisors get paid? Do you go in and as a, you know, a client and write them a check? What a wonderful question. And all advisors are paid different. There's okay. so many different programs. 25 years ago, there was one way of doing it. And you'd pay a commission. You'd buy a product, pay a commission. However, it always leaves in people's mind when I call you up, Deb, let's buy or sell X, Y, Z. He goes, is he doing this for him to Mm. generate a commission or is he doing this for me? So all of a sudden the advent of fees started somewhere in the late 90s, if I remember right. And that's where as your account goes up in value, not only do you profit, but the financial advisor profits more. So it tends to align their values and even the Department of Labor made some moves couple, three years ago, um, trying to pigeonhole everybody into paying these fee-based advisors. Uh, another way to pay an advisor is to, um, sorry to bang on the table. Yeah, you're fine. That's taboo. <laughs> um, 
is you come to me, you pay a, just a flat fee, and I design your financial plan. I give it to you, and you come back for monitoring as needed. But, but you're you on know, your own to execute. But you're you're on your own to execute. Okay. So it's more for a, a doer. Is that something that you offer with Thurston Springer? Absolutely. Okay. That's kind of interesting because I know there are people that kind of like to do some of that trading and, you know, and whatever they have kind of their own plan. And, or for people, you know, like me, a big, you know, my portfolio, a big part of my portfolio is real estate and you're not really involved in that part of it, but you could definitely advise me and do advise me on, you know, just trying to set things up um, so that they're most advantageous in meeting our goals. Cause our goals for our rental properties that's a retirement because we don't have 401ks and things like that. And so, you know, we're looking to use that for a big chunk of our retirement. Having a clear and open discussion of fees and options with your financial advisor is a good way to select a financial advisor and make sure that he's working in your best interest. Um, don't believe that just because something appears free from the outside, they're not charging you anything and you don't get a bill for it. Mm -hmm. Trust me, every single product out there has a fee. You either see it or you don't. So make sure they disclose fully what's inside that. So what's the question that people need to ask to, so they can get to the bottom of that when they walk in and they're interviewing a financial advisor? What is your investment style? Mm -hmm. Talk to me about your fees. Talk to me about the services you provide. Talk to me about your follow-up. Um, talk to me about how much hand-holding you have, the different programs you offer. Um, Everybody invests slightly different. And in a perfect world, I suppose we should invest utilizing a number of different um, portfolio methods. Mm -hmm. um, so, But you have to understand what their particular investment style happens mm -hmm. to be and make sure it's aligned with yours. And I guess that's the hard part is if you're starting out, whether you're young or whether you know, you're in your 40s and you're starting out, how do you know what your investment style is? You really don't. You ask a lot of questions. Yeah. It's like going to a doctor. Yeah. And if you get that bad vibe, go to a different doctor. If yeah. say you have cancer, seek a second opinion. Okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So most financial advisors, you can call them up and say, hey, you know, I'd love to have an appointment just to kind of talk over. I'm looking for someone to help guide me. And then there's no fee, right, for that initial yeah, consultation. A consultation, you know, can I borrow a half hour of your time, mm -hmm. pick your brain a little bit? And you'll learn a lot about the advisor's response. Okay. Yeah. And I think the big part is not being afraid to ask the questions that, you know, they say the only stupid question is the one not asked. Right. And we get that in real estate too, that people come in and they're like, well, I don't know. I, I want to, you know, there's questions that they want to ask, but they're afraid to. We've been doing these hops and homes programs at Switch Our Brewing. And it's been really fun because people have literally come in with typed out spreadsheets of questions that I don't know that they're not going to just call up a realtor and ask these questions, but we were trying to create an environment mm -hmm. where people could come and just ask and it was okay um, to ask those kinds of questions. And if you're the type of person that needs a, an advisor that's going to be there at 7 o'clock mm -hmm. on Sunday, you've got to make sure that advisor is going to be there mm -hmm. for you. And a lot of them aren't. You've got yeah. to find out what their minimums are. Yeah. You've got to find out because realistically, there's only so many people we can service properly. Mm -hmm. And once you get too many people, you lose relationships. Yeah. And are you going to be the bottom of the rung or are you going to be the top of the ladder? So if you're working, if someone says, you know, okay, I want to work with a financial advisor, I interview a few, and this is the one I want to work with, how often would you be checking in with that financial advisor or meeting with that financial advisor? I've got some old stock jockeys that still I talk to daily. And love really? To death. Absolutely. Um, I've got other people that want to be contacted every three months. Some yeah. people, Deb, mm -hmm. only if it's broken. Yeah. No. Um, right now, yeah. Once a year yeah. is typically a fiduciary's role. They have to meet once a year, document that you have spoken. But I think that goes back to, because I'm a once a year person as well. It goes back to if you trust the financial advisor that, that you've interviewed and you've asked these questions and you feel comfort, comfortable enough and confident in their capacity and, you know, and, and what they're able to provide for you, I think seeing them once a year you know, because we talked about this on the break, you know, do you work with a client's attorneys and uh, accountants and mm. just, you know, if you have a team of people. And I just think it's important that if you trust your person, um, you know, you trust that they're that they're doing they're following the same plan that you guys created. Well, together. and I think that's the key. You just said the key word was plan. If you've got a plan and you've got goals in place, 
then everybody's working towards that path. And you probably can get by with not having to meet all the time. But if the plan's There's changing... There's a lot of behavioral coaching that goes on. Everyone thinks it's all about asset management. Mm-hmm. But in reality, we see market corrections. You know, the Dow's down today. The Dow's up tomorrow. Uh, we've got tariffs going on. You start to get questions. Mm-hmm. And a good financial advisor is going to kind of dig in your psyche and share with you some facts. Mm-hmm. This is true. This is headline news. This is scare. This is that. And it's not that we have a crystal ball. But we can coach you just based on our, our wealth of knowledge of years of experience and being there doing that. How long have you been doing this? 25 years. 25 years. Feel old. I know. Well, because you started when you were one. Mm-hmm. And so I know one of the things you've said to me over and over again is that experience does count for a lot in this field. Um, and that because if you've never been through a bad market, then it's hard to advise your clients on how to stay calm and not make rash decisions, right? I was in school in college, and uh, it was just following the crash of 87. Mm -hmm. So when I got out and started my own practice, I thought, well, I'm going to avoid stocks, and I'm going to sell a lot of bonds. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we encounter 1994, where the Fed raises interest rates, I believe, four times in a year. And all my bond clients were just getting devastated. It was amazing. You can lose money in a a, a kind of a protected asset. Mm -hmm. So that's experience one. Then the late nineties, you find out, well, we need to diversify farther. So we'll buy U S stocks and international. Yeah. And then all of a sudden Japan starts to move. The Pacific basin becomes headline news. You start to put in some uh, international securities and then, oh my gosh, we need gold and commodities. And the game becomes more difficult and investing has grown so much more challenging in 25 years. There's so many more products out there. Yeah. So I think that's important. You you had mentioned the word fiduciary and I'd like to point out that no one can say that word and sound sober, just like the word judicial. I'm not even going to try either of those. Fiduciary, fiduciary. Uh, It's actually a word we use in real estate too, that we have fiduciary responsibilities to our clients, which means um, we have ethical obligations and loyalty obligations and um, looking out for their best interests. And I think the definition is probably similar. Um, but the I think word Merriam Webster would describe a fiduciary as somebody who puts their interest before their own, puts your, your interest, interest before yeah. their own. Yeah. And so, why does that, how does that come into play with financial advisors? There can be a lot of money in the financial business. And if you're working with somebody who's in it for the money, they are going to recommend products that may benefit them more than they really benefit you. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to make sure that they're more interested in what you need. And if I do a good job by mm-hmm. Deb, you're going to turn me on to somebody else, right. to somebody else, to somebody else, and my business will grow holistically. So how do you, if you're meeting a financial advisor, how do you gauge that where their interests are? <laughs> Word of mouth is something great. I would go to Broker Check. Broker Check is a wonderful resource. Not just check the it's individual. It's a website. It's a website. I believe it's brokercheck.org. Okay. Um, you can go straight to the SEC website. Um, seeing somebody's experience, um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with saying, "Can I talk to a few of your satisfied clients?" Great. And I get an okay from them, and you call mm-hmm. them up, and they tell you about their experience. Yeah. And of course, I pick someone I've worked with twenty five years. Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, so maybe you say, "Can I talk with someone who you've worked with for five years and someone you've worked with for twenty five years?" Absolutely. So, I mean, as a as a client, you have to protect yourself and. Very, very similar things with real estate. Um, Absolutely. You know, but you're hiring someone to do a job for you. And so you should interview them and you should ask whatever questions you need to, to make them feel comfortable. And, and I think you want to make sure the person's a good match as well. There's got to be a certain, you've got to be kind of attracted to the person and not in a physical sense. Right. But you guys have to kind of fire off the same page. And if you do, that's a good start. And then if they do prove ethical, honest, they do have the proper designations, uh, make sure they can sell every possible asset under the sun. Uh, makes them more knowledgeable. Make sure they've got some alphabet soup uh, behind their name, mm-hmm. um, just the fancy lettering. Um, it makes them more knowledgeable. Time in the business makes them more knowledgeable. I'll yep. step off my soapbox. <laughs> no, I'm the same way with real No, but I think it's great that they have a website that you can go to to check those out. I mean, Yeah, I never knew that. that. I didn't either. But it's the same like in like the lending world. Like you can go and check. Mm-hmm. 
a bank, a mortgage company, an individual lender to see what complaints have been filed against them. And like, that's all public knowledge. Yeah. Cause you know, when my, when this family member that I referred to earlier that doesn't trust her financial advisor, you know, when, when we found out and he has a funny name too. So, which I won't say, but I'll have to call me if you want to know his name. Cause it's a funny name. But anyways, um, we Google, that's all we knew to do. And we found like one, somebody complaining about something, but you know, there's almost always one person who complains. We figure he's got hundreds of clients. So we were like, I don't know if we should do anything with that or not. And it's, you know, always just been a, a mystery to us. If you Google best financial firm, you're probably going to find the biggest. Yeah. And there is some people believe that the biggest is the best, the Merrill Lynch, the mm -hmm. Morgan Stanley's. And that may not so be the truth. I'll give you a perfect example. One of my favorite gas stations is down by the house Amy and I built mm -hmm. called Johnny's Junctions. Yes, Johnny's it's Junctions. It's got a 50, 60 theme, homemade ice cream, yep. great food. Fried it's chicken livers. Little, oh my gosh, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's a lifesaver for yep. milk on a Sunday. Yep. Uh, but it doesn't have a big BP Amico or a marathon, but they've got an entire wealth of resources within there. Yeah. Great ice cream. Right, right. So it's more the boutique um, kind of smaller firm and, and catering to what the people in the all area firms, really need. All advisors have, we're, we're all fishing from the same pond. Right. It's all how we design our assets and how we build it. So you're with Thurston Springer. That's, like I said uh, in the first segment, that's a new firm here in town. How are they different from all the other firms? Wow. So anytime you transition from a firm to another firm, mm -hmm. um, you encounter some difficulties. And I know with a big company, my prior company was a large firm. And if there was something that was really broken, that I knew was broken, that I needed changed, um, do you think my boss is going to immediately change it and protocol for the entire firm is going to change? Right. Nah. Just for Matt, not <laughs> just for Matt. <laughs> not going to happen. It's not even going to hit the board of directors desk. Right. Yeah. When I was doing this onboarding process, I encountered some things because I transitioned before mm -hmm. and I encountered some things that were just not working for me. And I shared that. And within five minutes, I get an email from the president of the company. I love your idea. This is going to be part of transition protocol going forward. So it makes it very nimble, and I, I find that quite appealing. Awesome. So, yeah, I love that, too. Um, biggest misconception. This is your opportunity as we wrap up. What, what's the one thing you want people to know about being a financial or ha working with a financial advisor or that you think you know, you're always correcting people about? Um, that is such a tough, tough question. I know, because there's probably a bunch one. of them, right? <laughs> I really don't know how to answer that one truthfully. Yeah. I don't know if there are any misconceptions. Um, well, that you're not scary people. I, I think that's say, like, don't, Yeah, don't feel intimidated to reach out to to Matt or you know to, yeah. to anyone and just get the conversation started. Right. I think. And that's, keep in mind, uh, here's a misconception. Like I can do this. Um, <laughs> people buy a house or mm -hmm. buy a car, and they won't involve their advisor. Mm -hmm. You are paying mm -hmm. us a fee to help you navigate this financial path. So when you're making a purchase, how do I best pay for this? What mm -hmm. do I do? Do I save? I'm buying this house for having a baby. Involve them. Be proactive. We are not sitting at your front door 24-7 watching what you're doing. So involving us in all steps of your financial right. progress. That's a, that's a great tip. I have met with a few clients, financial advisors, and I always love that when I have that sort of team meeting um, so that we can make sure that everybody's on the same page and, um, and that, you know, I am able as a realtor, I'm able to look out for their best interests because, you know, I've had, I got, I have all the information. Yeah. I was going to say that just reminded me that I've had a financial advisor call me and say, okay, I know you've been sp speaking with my client. We're trying to determine whether we're going to use their cash mm -hmm. or if we're going to pull from a certain investment. So they're wanting to know my fees, what the interest rate is, things like that, so that they can then go back to mm -hmm. the mutual client yeah, yeah. and say, here's what we think we should do yep. with your with your plan. Right. It takes a team. Mm -hmm. Surround yourself with a great team uh, and you will get far. So what's the best way that people can get in touch with you if they're interested in having that conversation? Uh, 812-360-9975. All right. Um, 414 North Morton. 414 Stop North by. Morton, right across from the farmer's market. Come say hi. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a beautiful office, too. So, but Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, for listening and putting up with my 
fading voice as I go off and sing Smelly Cat. And y'all have no idea how much fun it is sitting in this room. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? Ladies, this is a blast. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, listen to this episode a couple times. There's some really good information. And like I said, it's kind of a how-to um, as opposed to the feel-good. But it's so important, and I just want people to feel empowered to go have those conversations and start making good decisions. Um, start when you're 22 and put your $2,000 a year aside and you're all set, right? For eight years, you're done. <laughs> don't stop. <when> you're <laughs> <laughs> all right. Don't listen to me. Listen to your financial advisor. All right. Thanks for listening. And we'll be back with another episode. You are at home in Bloomington. Got a show idea? I'd love to hear it. And be sure to contact me for all your real estate needs and questions too. You can email me at deb at realrealestatetoday.com and follow me on Facebook at Deb Tomorrow Realtor. To contact Karen Rastel for all your mortgage needs, call 812-606-7653 or log on to ruoff.com and go to the Bloomington Center. Thanks to all the Bloomington people who make production of At Home in Bloomington possible. Special thanks to superstar producer Rachel Gregorio, digital guru Cynthia Hogan at Monster Digital Marketing for website design and hosting, and video genius Wes Lasher in the production house for engineering the show.